Uh, we will find a way to weave that in today, especially when we get to the slides. Um, <clears throat> so quick recap last week. We, we saw a failed marriage um, at, with Samson and his would-be bride. There's this horrific escalation of revenge of, of escalating one after another. Tension and anger is just building to a boiling point. It started with riddles about a lion and honey and wagers with people that he shouldn't even be with. A, a betrayal by his betrothed, not for the last time. Innocent, 30 innocent people will be murdered for, the, for their clothing to pay that bet. And there's an, Im an impulsive abandonment of anger by Samson after that episode, which he later unrealistically thinks can be repaired by just re returning to the scene, thinking the wife could be his, his after all. But no, she'd been given away, and in return, he burns and destroys maybe most of their food and economy, uh, to which the bride and the dad uh, are blamed and burned. They pay the price for which they were originally coerced to, uh, by the same penalty. And then Samson kills those people. So I think you can agree with me that the tensions are, are high here. <laughs> right? But, but this was the Lord's doing. Remember back in chapter 14, 4, God said he was looking for an opportunity to stir up trouble with the Philistines, and trouble indeed has been stirred. So Samson now lives in a cave in Edom for a while. And I'm going to uh, pop to a slide, I think. Okay, before I switch, I want you to picture in your mind what Samson looks like. Now, we don't know, and we'll never know this side of heaven, but I want you to think, what do you think he looks like? I think that this was a fun exercise for me, and I'm going to be a little provocative, because you might think he looks like this. At least Hollywood thinks <laughs> Cecil B. DeVille thought he looked like the gentleman in the top left, with Hattie Lamar, by the way. Um, and uh, a more recent movie, which I haven't seen, Looks like that, and then, here, then he, here, there he is in the right, in like a you know a children's biblical illustration. Well, the first thing we see is Samson doesn't like shirts, um, <laughs> and Samson is a big Schwarzenegger kind of dude. But I would like to suggest we don't know that we have no information that suggests that he had a physical prowess to him. I think more likely, or more possibly, or more interestingly, he could have just been an average person like anyone here. But the hair was the trick. Not that he was naturally built like that. The hair, right? All right, well, now I got your attention. Um, so what do the Philistines do in reaction to all the things we talked about? Well, they array themselves for battle. They come and they say, what do they want to do? We want to take Samson prisoner so that we can do to him what he has done to us. It's not so much to stop the threat, but there's the revenge. The revenge theme just keeps going throughout this entire thing. And he's confronted by 3,000 of the Judahites. Any trivia question? Does any remember what tribe uh, Samson's from? Dan. Very good. So it's not even his own people. That's got to add a little bit of uh, tension on top of the tension. And 3,000. I kept thinking how to think of 3,000. Like how many people are on an average block... Well, think of it this way. If I take 54 people and make a line, and then make 54 lines of 54 people, that's how many 3,000 people is. That's a lot of people. You've got to think, how would I deal with one person with 3,000 people? Like, I can't even, maybe like six, but once I get to hundreds, what are these people in the back doing? They're just going to be like, well, if you guys don't make it, maybe we'll be your reinforcements. But, but anyway... And then we ask ourselves, are these Judahites walking with God? That's really our, what I want to hopefully impart on you is the importance of walking with God because we know God is walking with them through the power he's displaying. But are, are they consulting God? Are the Judah people remembering what happened with the other 11 judges we've been through? Do they remember what Deborah could pull off? Can, she, can they remember what Gideon did with its minuscule army? I don't know. I think they're thinking that that isn't going to happen because they say, do you not know that the Philistines rule over us? Why have you done this to us? Well, he could consult God and, and they could find out. 
But what they're really saying is, you know we can't win. Not with, right? They're not, they don't remember what's happened before, or they don't want to believe it could happen again. Samson also seems to be a guy that gets betrayed a lot. And here's another one, right? First by his fiance and now by, these, by his own people. Samson doesn't ask God what to do or what to go on either. Or he would know it's part of the plan. And he says in a defense to why he did what he did, he said, well, I've only done to them what they have done to me. Right? This never-ending escalation here. So they negotiate something and they say, well, we're going to hand you over to the Philistines, but we won't kill you. How's that? that and he, he agrees to that. And they tie him up with brand new ropes. Okay, so now you're going to find out um, why I picked this sermon in the first place. I'm going to kind of give a little devotion to a jawbone here, which sounds very odd. But let's, this is the passage we've come to here. When Samson arrived in Lehi, or I actually have been told it's Lehi, the Philistines shouted as they approached him. As you would expect, this is the guy that's been causing all the trouble. But the Lord's spirit empowered him. The ropes around his arms were like flax, dissolving in fire, and they melted away from his hands. He happened to see a solid jawbone of a donkey. This, by the way, is what one looks like, as you have already guessed. He grabbed it and struck down 1,000 men. Remember how many Judahites were there? 3,000. That's interesting. Why didn't they? Well, Samson then said, with the jawbone of a donkey, I have left them in heaps. With the jawbone of a donkey, I've struck down a thousand men. And when he finished speaking, he threw the jawbone down and named that place Ramath Lachai. Now, that's a pretty decent story, right? But I'm going to share with you how this story is probably the reason I'm standing here today and why I married that person and many other things. That jawbone. Not that one, but one like it. <laughs> or maybe that one. They, okay. So, I want you to count how many jawbones you see in green here. All right, let's, we see one, two, three, four. Four jawbones, don't we? Now, the, it could shift it a little bit. But. And on the left, we have the Hebrew. Now, I will give you a little hint and say that the Hebrew word for jawbone is, is this sequence here, which is pronounced Lachai, but I couldn't tell you why. But that's, that's what that sequence means, so, with some help from some of my Jewish friends. Okay, now I want you to count how many squares on the left side are jawbone. Wait a minute, six? I thought we had four. Why did we now have two extra? The city. It would be like if you were born in the town of Baseball Bat. <laughs> and you heard of a story where some hero from your town did a big whooping with a baseball bat, and that's why you live in baseball bat. Right? And the pastor I went to that day told us that Lehi means baseball bat. So now if you read this, when Samson arrived in Jawbone, right? And I won't read the whole thing, and when he's done, Name that place the high place of Jawbone. If you lived in Chicago, we used to have like places called the Heights, Palis Heights, Orland Heights, whatever. They called it the Heights. In other words, it's an area that's up high. And remember, he was up high, and people were kind of swarming him from below, and he's just taking them out one at a time with the Jawbone. So this really grabbed my attention. And here's a diagram of how this all worked. So my friend John, who I've been a pinball friend with since college, uh, and we grew very close, and he one day said, hey, why don't you come to church with me? I'm like, why would I do that? I'm not being funny. I really said, why would I spend my Sunday doing that? I believe in Jesus. I tell people to worship, but I'm not going to go to church. I'm done with that now. Okay, John, for you, I'll go. And he takes me to this very modest church, which you can't read, Emmanuel Baptist Church in Illinois. And um, I sit down. First of all, I've been a Lutheran. And um, Lutheran songs are not nearly as lively as Baptist songs. <laughs> they are so, I mean, A Mighty Fortress is pretty good, but the rest are just very plodding, right? But these are like some rousing it as well as my soul and go tell it on the, like, first of all, music is a win. Um, 
and then Pastor Keith in the lower right here. Pastor Keith is one of these people that is, demonstrates God's power. Because Pastor Keith was not a born ed, uh, uh, super uh, person that would pursue deep literature and analyses and that. Pastor Keith, I believe, came from uh, you know, modest beginnings in the Navy. But the intellectual depth of his analysis and the presentation was compelling to me in a way that changed my life. Including this. This is a little detail, but this little detail grabbed my attention and um, completely captivated me. So this jawbone pro uh, pr preserved by the Israel priest, and yes, that is from Indiana Jones, but that was the best picture I could find <laughs> to really capture the cool mystic, but, but hey, you know. And then Pastor Keith told me this sermon we're talking about today, and John said, on the upper left, he said, if you like this, well, you'll really like BSF. And I, hate, I don't want to make a BSF into an idol. But I said, I want more of this pure Bible immersion. And I want to know more about this stuff. Because now I know the Bible is more than Adam and Eve, Noah's Ark, fast forward a while, Jesus, Revelation 666, end. <laughs> right? There's a whole bunch of material in there that I've not even looked at. And I want to know more about it. So thank you, Pastor Keith. And that's Chuck Musfeld, who was my first leader for BSF. I found out I was very privileged to have him as a teaching leader. Um, he went on to be like an international ambassador for BSF. He was a doctor who somehow found time to still do his weekly Bible study. And then he, he did die tragically of a car accident. But all this is, God uses all this. That's his a beautiful, rich tapestry of a story about a jawbone, a translation, all that. Is, is fundamental to, to me. And you have your own stories, but now you know a little bit of mine. Okay. All right. Oh, oh that's it. Okay, great. All right, so <clears throat> God is walking with Samson in this, in this, this story when he dispatches the, the Philistines, um, but he takes credit. He says, well, I, look what I have done to them, what they have done to me. Um, and, and he gives the town the name Jawbone. There's other towns that are named after God, like Bethel. Right? If he doesn't name it after God, he names it after the tool. But, you know, this is Samson. And, but he's thirsty. He's thirsty and he says, God, you have given your servant this great victory. That's good. He's giving him the credit. Um, but um, he doesn't see this God, quite the way God probably does. He says, well, you gave me this victory for revenge. And God is saying... Well, no, I'm preserving my people. I'm preserving, you're part of my mission. But still, Samson, in typical grumbling fashion, says, but now must I die and of thirst and fall into the hands of the Philistines? You know, complaining, right? And that's one of these beautiful things about the Bible. It's authentic with real human emotions and episodes that happen. We don't lift up everybody as perfect exemplars of human beings, right? These, these are flawed people just like you and I. And at least he gave God credit. Um, God then does a miracle. He splits this Lehi, Lehi basin. The water's restored. Supposedly this is, is, was seen at the day that this was written and, um, and restores Samson. And he goes on to then lead the Israelites for 20 years. I think it's easy to kind of blast through there and not take a moment to think, 20 years of Samson. That's a long time. That means probably he was in his, certainly in his 30s, maybe his 40s. And you got to wonder what that rule was like. Like, is that Sam, uh, like Superman, like where he just occasionally, I need, I need someone just to do a big, big victory here. Um, or did he grow into more of a leader? I don't know. It doesn't look like he matures much by what we're about to see. But um, there was a 20-year period where he's running the show. We actually can do a little bit of math when we see how many people die in the temple to know that there really aren't any more of these massive victories in the middle. And we'll come back to that when we get to the end. Um, at this point, Samson decides to go to Gaza, which is 50 miles away, the same Gaza that we're talking about in the news all the time now. It's on the coast, um, down a bit from where he got the cloaks from the 30 people he, he killed for those. And he, he goes to see a prostitute. And he does what you do with the prostitute. This is another example of him not being very set apart, uh, returning to his, um, his previous mistake of going with a Philistine woman. And word spreads naturally. Hey, the 
Superman's here, right? Samson's here. And the, and the Philistines surround the temple and hide at the gate in a very relaxed way. They're like, well, we're going to be prepared. We're here. We're surrounding it. We know he's not going to be here forever. There's no way out, and we'll get him in the morning. Samson, though, though is, it leaves a little earlier, halfway through the night, and very casually seems to come to the front door, observe the doors, remove them, remove the posts that the doors were attached to, and carries them away without any confrontation. Either they're too afraid or, or just, this is, after all, Samson. He's indestructible. And he walks them 40 miles away. 40 miles of these doors hauled to Hebron and disposes of them there. I don't know. Maybe he's saying, you thought you could nullify the Jewish people's protection? Well, I'll take away your protection, these gates, which was a big deal. To not have gates around your city was, was a, was a, was a non-trivial uh, problem. A little bit later, um, he has his rebound. He's back in the Sora Valley, which is where he came from to begin with, and falls in love with Delilah. And we had Hedy Lamar up there. The, the movie version and the popular version would, would say that Delilah is of what nationality or what people group? Is she a Philistine? What else could she be? She could be a Danite or Jewish too, right? I think I at least thought well, she must be a Philistine. She kind of has that Jezebel quality to her, like the femme fatale, like, mm, and, and indeed this, that happens. But I think there's clues that suggest she's not a Philistine. And, and, um, and this isn't a map theory. There's plenty of other people that I've read about that believe this too. Um, she may very well be a local girl from the same place he's from. And you think, well, how could that happen? How could she betray Samson? Because I guess we never betray any of our own people, do we? Especially when money's involved. Um, we'll see. Because the Philistine, one clue is the Philistine rulers went up to see her. It's fun that there's these little teeny clues in there sometimes to tell this thing. The fact that they went upward, commentators have said indicate that, she, that they went from where they lived up to where they lived. Which, um, and she also, they say, you need to trick him. Find out what makes him so strong and how we can subdue and humiliate him. They also previously had threatened their own people with, with being killed, but this time they offer money, 1,100 silver pieces, namely. And I know we never know what to do with those numbers, right? What is 1,100 silver pieces? Sounds like pretty nice. I mean, is that like a set of silverware? Like, um, one way to remember that is a silver piece was kind of a day's wage, and there's five leaders who each offer 1,100. I should say the we have to kind of extrapolate that there are five, but give or take. So that's 5,500 silver pieces at a day's wage gives you somewhere between one and four million dollars. Like this is lifestyle adjusting money. This is not, um, you know, uh, Judas for 20 pieces of silver. This is, a, this is a big deal. The movie version is a little different, by the way, if you watch the Cecil B. DeMille one. It's where Samson picks another woman and irritates um, uh, Delilah to the point where she betrays him later. So you've got to ask yourself, how, did this, how does he end up with Delilah? Has anyone ever heard the principle, and this is a little close to home maybe for some of us, but sick tends to marry sick. What? Yeah, right? We, we tend to gravitate toward to people that have similar flaw, character flaws and strengths to us. And people that don't walk with God, we, we need to be equally yoked, right? People that don't walk to God often don't mix well with people that do, at least at first. And that's a big problem, which we're not going to go into today. But it's not unlikely that she also is an impulsive, thrill-seeker, attracted-to-danger kind of person. Someone who does not consult God or remember where they came from. Um, and what the clue here for us is, you know, we may need people that make us more uncomfortable than comfortable, especially when we're looking for people who can be with us at the lowest level, who can coach us and, and be our, our, our confidants. But Samson seems to find someone that's not entirely different from him in terms of lifestyle. Well, Delilah doesn't waste any time, and she says, 
tell me what makes you so strong. Now, if she stopped there, I'd be like, okay, sure. Like, yeah, I've always been curious, man. How are you so good at pinball? Like, that would be a legitimate question and a good question. Um, but no, she says, what makes you so strong? And how could you be subdued? And also, how could you be humiliated? <laughs> That's how she says. And you say, that could not have been what she said. But see, people that live dangerously like to play with kind of fire. They like that kind of playful deception that the same kind of person that would do rash things like ripping gates off and killing 30 people would probably be attracted to someone and not have a problem with someone that plays with fire in that way. Well, Samson says, what you got to do is you need seven undried fresh bowstrings. Oh, that's kind of funny. So before we, everyone saw the ropes tied and, and dissolving like flax. Sure. Oh, it was the wrong kind of rope and the wrong number of ropes. Okay, thank you. And so she goes off and reports to the Philistine leaders and tells them. And Samson gets tied up, tied up. And for the first of four times, she says, the Philistines are here, Samson. And he snaps them. And that's the end of the little episode. We don't really see the Philistines running in and then running back out. We just know that it's a fail. So Delilah says, you lied to me. Now, tell me, tell me, what, what's the real secret? And again, you think normal people, healthy people would say, I know what you're going to do again. What, what is this? But these are people that, that, are, that, are, that are live a different lifestyle that's not a walking with God lifestyle. So this time he says, ah, see, tightly tie me with brand new ropes. And now we see a short memory, because they were brand new ropes before, when we started today. So they should have known that that wasn't going to work, but the same result happens. Boom. So now we're in the third time, and now we're going to play with fire. Because the third time, Samson says, the way to get me is weave my seven braids of hair into a loom with into fabric and then put your pin through it. Now, we think that's funny, but did you notice he's, he's, he's letting a bit of his secret out? Why did he bring his hair into it? Why did he even provide any clues? Did he run out of rope ideas? I don't think so. <laughs> Isn't there that temptation, that compromise, when the world wants something, to compromise yourself, to give them just a little bit, just a little bit of, of something? Maybe he liked living dangerously. Maybe he just was so convinced he was invincible that he's like, whatever, that's fine. Well, that doesn't work either, right? And, and as, as expected. And so in the fourth and last time, she really pours it on and says, how can you say I love you when you won't share your secret? That's like a good template for when you go home. How can you say you love me when you won't fill in the blank, right? That's great marriage techniques right there. <laughs> Always get what you want. <laughs> so, and she nags him daily with this, with this, right? And at some point, he's sick to death of it. Now, don't underestimate the power of peer pressure. Don't underestimate the power of how much we want the world to love us. Um, we can say, how, how dumb were you? You had, why did you tell her the answer is kryptonite when you didn't have to? All right, but he gives in. He says to her, my hair has never been cut. I've been dedicated to God since I was conceived. If you shave my head, I'm going to lose my strength. And again, you have to wonder why. You had one job, one job. Leave the hair alone. He doesn't consult God. God gives him pretty a lot of slack in the way he lives. In every other way, just the hair, leave it alone. But don't we also just have one job? To love the Lord our God with all our might and strength and to accept Jesus is that fullest manifestation of that. But how often do we forsake God under peer pressure? Did we do it today? Maybe. So we all have our hair that we need to protect. We have to remember that our power like his is on loan. We don't own the hair. We don't own the power. We have it and we have to take good care of it. 
And we also have to remember when we have that pressure from our Delilahs of saying, please, you, if you only do this, I'll, I'll like you more and I'll celebrate you more. That no amount of man stuff, person, human stuff, praise, being loved, being given things, is convertible in an economic sense to God's stuff. Being accepted by people and having success and not being in the doghouse with your wife even is not exchangeable for one God token for anything. Because unlike how the song goes, you cannot buy the stairway to heaven. Right? It is not for sale. <clears throat> so Delilah, given this hot tip, is so sure this time, uh, you, you can just tell that she summons the rulers, and this time they bring the money with them. Like, it's kind of not a try before you buy. It's like, we're, we know this is going to work. This is it. Um, and he falls asleep in her lap, showing again that he had complete trust in her, um, and he didn't have sense of the danger. They come, they shave the braids off, um, and, and, and he squandered his strength. He's going to lose everything. And, you know, this is a metaphorical moment. When God is a gift for you, you know, it should be protected. You know, in when you should wear a hat, a metaphorical hat here. Don't just have your hair out there for someone to steal and to, uh, to ruin. And especially if we could use all the hair we can get. Right, Mike? So, yeah. um, she <laughs> got an amen for that one. Okay. So the Philistines say, she says for the fourth and last time, the Philistines are here. And Samson does his routine, shakes free, but then he realizes God has left him and immediately pays the price with his eyes. He's blinded now. They haul him back to Gaza. Do you remember we were at Gaza earlier before where, where he had his prostitute? He knows the way there. He's made that walk before. He's got 50 miles to think about what just happened. He's put in bronze chains, and he's, we were told he becomes a grinder. I had to look up what that meant. Um, a grinder is someone who processes corn, grinds up the corn which is a really not great job. It's the worst job among bad jobs in prison. And that's what his job is now. He went from being pick of the litter, unlimited power, do what I want, to now grinding corn in the enemy's prison. But his hair is growing back. It, it, it tells us in verse 22. But the Philistines seem to also not remember, and they don't care about God because they don't take any precautions. You think they could say, look, uh, every, every morning... <laughs> You're going to need to tend to that hair because we can't let that happen again. But they seem to have forgotten because they have now attributed everything to their great god Dagon, for which they're now having a big party and a big sacrifice all around Samson's capture. Dagon, and there's a lot of information about him, but he seems to be related to a prosperity god, and he figures prominently all through the, the, the Semitic region there. Um, uh, and... Um, uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, thank you, Dagon, for bringing us Samson af after he destroyed our prosperity before, right? Here's, he, this is the answer. Our God has handed Samson, our enemy, over to us, said the rulers. You wonder if Samson could hear that. Like, if he heard that Dagon is the reason that Samson's here, he's like, no, I know the reason. Dagon's got nothing to do with it. I am the reason you're, I'm here. I'm the reason that I wasn't uh, sober with my gifts that God gave me. And the reason that I was so strong was God. So you know there was going to be a little outrage saying, don't give Dagon credit. Dagon is nothing. But also the shame that I can't do anything about it this time. At least not quite yet. The people also say the same thing. Our God has handed the enemy over to us. So everyone's celebrating in this temple. They're celebrating that this is the one who ruined our land and killed so many of us, in that order, interestingly. Um, and so that's a way to remember when he did that fox burning thing, that was a significant impact on their, their land. That wasn't just a prank. So they all say, go get Samson, in verse 25. Bring Samson to entertain us. And he's made to stand between two pillars. There's an unnamed young man um, who Samson asks if he could maybe put me by the pillars that support the temple. <laughs> and I think that young man had quite an engineering and architectural knowledge to know that one. That's the one there. Not this one, we don't, but this is the one you want to be near. If you want to take down Mahani Hall, stand next to that. Right. Well, and, and he doesn't see a problem with that, and he puts him 
exactly there. Um, the, then all the Philistine rulers are there, kind of lucky for, for us, 3,000 men and women watching Samson. And here, Samson has a big moment for him. As close to maybe redemption as he'll, he'll ever have on this, in this life anyway. He says in chapter 16, 28, Lord, he says, O oh Master, remember me. Strengthen me one more time so I can get swift revenge for my two eyes. Let's critique that. So, oh, master, great. Thank you. You've, you've acknowledged that he, God is in control and he's the master. Now, revenge for my two eyes, sure. But what we're really trying to do here is safety for the Jewish people so that we can show that it's you, God, who have the power, not Dagon. But, you know, we can still accomplish that even if we, we miss, the, miss the sentiments a little bit. So, as everyone knows, he takes the pillars, leans, and he says, let me die with the Philistines. The temple collapses, and here we hear that many more people here die than in his life before. So that's how I said before, when he killed the 1,000, well, here he's killing 3,000. That means that he didn't kill much more than that, defeat that many more before. And I have to say, as I think of this blind person in the temple, defeated and in jail, with no obvious hope to get out, and yet does more than ever he did before. I have to ask, what limits do we put on God as what we can do based on our circumstances? Like, do we think we're all too old, too weak, past our prime, have already made too many mistakes to let God do our best work now? Well, then you think that Samson was strong because he looked like Arnold, not because of his hair. I think that's one thing we can take from here is that there's no way, we can't have screwed up too many times for God to have used us in some terrific way, God-glorifying way and soul-lifting way, even as a blind person in an enemy camp um, with, with really no obvious hope. So the temple collapses and, he, and that happens. And then his brothers come and get him. Um, which I found interesting. I guess the Philistines didn't have a problem with the Jew Israelites marching into their most holy temple, now destroyed, that they destroyed, evidently, and then burying him, taking, taking Samson away. Um, they bury him in his father's tomb. There's a fun clue there. We know his father now has died. Mom's left out again, even though, as we, a couple weeks, we found out Samson's mother probably had a lot more to do with his upbringing. But we come to the end of the Samson story. Thank you for four weeks of, uh, of, of, of our journey from the Seder to here. So to wrap up, we all have powerful weaknesses and powerful gifts. I mean, Samson had weaknesses. He was obsessed with revenge. He was a person that liked having sex with a lot of different people in ways he shouldn't have. He doesn't talk to God. Do you know your Weaknesses? Do you walk with God through those weaknesses, unlike Samson? Do you realize you can't solve these alone? And do you see the consequences of what happens when you just kind of let the world be your way to process those things? You end up with someone like Delilah that can't find truth. Or... Do you have, what is your hair? What is that source of power, the thing you God, God gave you for your work, but the thing that the world kind of wants from you, like maybe your time? your money, the things that God has for his power and purpose, but that the world would rather have for itself? And do you protect it? Do you protect it, set it aside? Or do you kind of just have it out there for people to, to, take, to steal or give away? And then who is your Delilah? Who are your people? Who are the people that you seem like a fit, the people that you want to, to think that you're great, but that amplify your worst and attenuate your best? Do you, are there people that make you choose between them and God? This is tough. This is tough stuff, but this is stuff that Samson went through, and it can be a lesson for us. We need to walk with God through all those three things to deal with them properly. Otherwise, now we go back to the last thing, that how did we get from phase one to phase two, from that spiritual mountaintop to being apostasy? Well, I think, and I think Samson shows us, it's because we didn't walk with God after having that moment. We just went and put God back on the shelf and just went through our daily lives and just saw how things happen. 
So then I ask you, and I'll close by saying, well, what victory, and hopefully it's not involving tearing down a temple, but what victory is waiting for you this week, this year, the rest of this lifetime, that walking with God could unlock? Okay, thank you. And I'll close in prayer. Dear God, thank you for these stories which have unlimited richness if we only spend the time to read them and that somehow, supernaturally, you've committed them to page and have preserved them for eons. Please be with us as we decide what each day should hold and guide us to your future. In Jesus' name, amen.